Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this CSC webinar on research data metadata. I am Jessica Palan von Essen, and this is Johan Chilanda. Hello. Oh. Yes, so today we're going to talk about the metadata for research data, and we'll begin giving brief introductions to some common metadata standards. First, a few descriptive metadata standards for research data, and then we go into the preservation metadata that is also important when thinking about the long term preservation mm -hmm. of research assets. Yes. And questions you can put in the chat box, and we will be answering them at the end of the webinar. And we will also record uh, this uh, webinar and it will be published in, uh, in the CSC YouTube channel. But please, Juan. Yes. So, welcome. And I'll start by talking briefly about Dublin Core. I hope everybody can hear me. So, Dublin Core is an old standard used for resource description and interoperability of, of uh, digital assets and other resources. And it has been created in the, already in the 90s, so it's an old established standard. It's managed by the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative, which is an open cross-disciplinary organization. And Dublin Core is uh, very open, and you can describe virtually anything using Dublin Core. And it's basically not a system, but it's a um, vocabulary defining a set of terms. And the original Dublin Core, also called simple Dublin Core, consists of 15 very basic metadata elements such as uh, a title of the resource being described, uh, the um, description of the resource, subjects such as keywords, different kinds of dates can be des described, and language metadata and, and so on. These are very simple, basic, descriptive elements. And uh, the idea behind the core is to create a sense of common semantic understanding and increase interoperability. And the elements are usually very self-explanatory, like title and description. And uh, the Core also includes a controlled vocabulary for different types, such as um, content types uh, that you can publish. And these have also been very influential in other standards and metadata formats for describing uh, material types, such as image or still images, sounds, um, moving image, data sets, collections, and so on. And um, the simple Dublin Core was quite simple. So it was extended, and the extension is called Qualified Dublin Core. That adds three new elements, and they are audience, provenance, and rights holder. And the Qualified Dublin Core also adds element refinements, that uh, further refine what the um, simple elements mean. This example is uh, spatial and temporal. It's refinements for coverage, which uh, could mean anything. And using these qualifiers, you can say that this is a um, geographical uh, coverage or, or a temporal time-based coverage when describing a resource. And in 2012, the DCMI Dublin Core Metadata Initiative metadata terms replace these two sets. And they can be described, for example, using RDF that describes relationships between the terms and their <coughs> history also, such as depicted below. And this is how it can look like, described using XML, an example taken from the Dublin Core uh, website. And you see it's very, very basic, simple to understand. And it's not a technical difficult standard and used very largely in the um, librarian sector in, when describing archival resources and basically any other, um, for describing any other types of, of content in the World Wide Web also. And it's, it's a vocabulary, so there is no um, metadata structure and no mandatory elements defined. We can use any of or all of the elements when describing a resource. And the homepage it 
is at doublingcore.org and it's very widely used and, and um, it's endorsed also by the Internet Engineering Task Force in its RFC 5013 and used, for example, by the Open Archives Initiative in the oh, AI PMH metadata protocol for metadata harvesting. And it was also the basis for the European element set, the older mm, metadata set for the European resources. And it's also used by many more like Darwin Core. And it's been so popular and widespread because it's easy to adopt, it's not technically difficult, and it fosters interoperability. And the main weaknesses that you can use to, to criticize Dublin Core is it's basically, you can call it too simple. The element set is too narrow to document um, a detailed level of resources. The structure is flat, so describing hierarchical structures is not really possible with using Dublin Core. And also the terms are so wide and open for interpretation, so they can mean anything. For example, the date can mean a lot of different dates, like the creation date of a resource, the publishing date of a resource, or, or any other date that you can think of. So Dublin Core has some weaknesses that it's been criticized for, but still it's, it's so easy to adopt and, and, and easy to understand. Uh, so it has become very popular and, and used very widely in the, also in the World Wide Web sector. So yes, okay. please. Thank you. So now let's talk about research data and uh, this uh, metadata and the research data context. Um, today, um, yeah, well, the Dublin Core, as you heard, is quite generic and it's not uh, really sufficient enough for, for um, research use because reproducibility of the research and you need to have sufficient documentation. So uh, fair data is uh, a reoccurring requirement today and we, that's something we, we would like to create fair research data and I'll just go through these quickly. Uh, F stands for findable so that means that uh, the data should be described in a, rele in a relevant catalog with enough detail and you should also have a landing page with a globally unique identifier otherwise you can't really find and cite the data if, if you don't have the, the landing page with the metadata it simply can't qualify as research data at all. Then the A stands for accessible, which means that the uh, data set can be retrieved over the internet. Uh, this doesn't mean that it should be open necessarily, but uh, that you could, should be able to download it if you have the correct access and, and rights and so forth. This can be put in place if needed. Uh, then also versioning and life cycle needs to be, management needs to be in place so you can be sure that you can access the correct version of the data so that you get exactly the correct data set. And also, even if the data isn't uh, available anymore, uh, then you need to have a tombstone page, tombstone page for, with the metadata. So you should always, always be uh, able to find some kind of information about the research data set if it has been cited. And I stand for interoperable, uh, which means that you should really use common documented and open formats both for the data itself and for the metadata. And R stands for reusable, uh, which means that the data should be intelligible enough, uh, sufficiently documented, and you also should have a clear right statement, whether it be then public domain open. Or, or some kind of creative dog commons license or whatever. So this is something that we really need to think about and be mindful. And I want to say some more words about the persistent identifiers, which play a very central part uh, when we talk about the reusability and site uh, 
citability of, of uh, research data. Uh, often a persistent identifier is a DOI, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, it, basically, it means that you have a, a unique identifier that always takes you to the same data set. Uh, usually, it's a uh, frozen, immutable data set publication with a landing page with a descriptive data, uh, metadata. And also remember that usually a data set can consist of several different files. Then there is the case of dynamic data sets, which is a bit more complex. Um, there are some rules and guidelines. Here you see the data set, data site uh, guidelines, but there are also from uh, the RDA and the Research Data Alliance and, and other guidelines. But this is, uh, well, basically, if you have a, don't have a, a frozen immutable data set, you need to be mindful and think about reproducibility of the research so that, that it can be ensured that the, a user can get hold of the same uh, data that has been used for any given research. So this is what you really need to, to think about, that you have the, the metadata and the persistent identifier in, in place. And, and also remember that uh, if it is a promise, you need to keep it forever. <laughs> so uh, there are really a lot of uh, different research data metadata formats because there are lots of communities there are hundreds maybe thousands of different metadata formats and it is also always you should try to of course find the correct which is for the context uh, domain specific which is created by the community and understood and suitable for for the need you needs you have uh, remember to to uh, be careful with the uh, master metadata and keep it separate from from aggregated metadata and self-reported information. That's one one thing I think it's uh, that's good to think about. Um, and it's all always good if you can find a, a suitable domain-specific metadata format uh, and just as a mention for those who publish on the web, that schema.org is a good uh, help also to use for, for findability. For instance, the new Google dataset search uses schema.org. So about data site. Uh, data site is a global known profit organization. It was founded in 2009 by some uh, national libraries and universities. Today there are about maybe 100 members. Um, the data site uh, organization has a general uh, common registry and it provides persistent identifiers for research data. The DOI is a handle-based system and it's good now to remember that the data site DOI is specifically meant for research data. It's not to be used for other kinds of publication, uh, other kinds of publications. And um, uh, we have in Finland CSC is a coordinator of a national data site consortium. So if you need, uh, want to allocate uh, data sites, if you uh, DOIs, if you have a, a data repository uh, which you uh, want to take, take data site and DOI into use, then you can be in touch with us and we can help you with that. So basically, data site, uh, the data site metadata is like a, a version of a generic uh, metadata, uh, data catalog metadata. Uh, like a, a developed Dublin Core version that is adapted for, for data citation and for research use. So this means that we have this mandatory uh, information like the identifier which is in real. If you use the data site DOI 
and the, the, the system, then you really need to have an OI identifier. You can also, of course, um, create uh, or use other kinds of assistant identifiers like URNs, but then it doesn't, uh, the data site validate, validators don't work with that and data site doesn't register those other anything else. Uh, then you have the mandatory information like creator title, publisher, publication year, resource type. And what's good to know is also that uh, data uh, site does uh, close cooperation with the uh, ORCID and OpenAir and uh, other uh, projects that work for the linking data and research information. So that's why DataSite and the DataSite OI is really a good choice, I think, because it serves the researchers well and it's, it's, it fits well into all this, this technology and these systems. So there are, of course, then other recommended and optional properties, uh, subjects, uh, contributor, date, language, different kinds of uh, identifier fields where you can uh, link or you have alt alternate identifiers, uh, size, format, version, rights, language, and then description, which I highly recommend that you use extensively because it, it is really um, a very important field for to enable re re reuse of the data. And then you can also use geolocation and also what's important, for instance, for, for the open uh, is the funding information. So uh, data site uh, really enables good quality generic metadata that is well, well suited for researchers and research use. Uh, we use it in our fair data, national fair data services and also you got me to share uses the data site toy. Uh, it isn't very flexible. For instance, uh, variables are, are not easily described with data site, but still it's, it's uh, developing. Uh, it's a really uh, active and good community, the data site community, and they have a, a good API and, and also this cooperation with the other research information actors is, is a good and important, I think. And also, uh, the, it, I think that the use DOI is really good because you have the strong brand, uh, since many end users don't really mind <laughs> or care about these technical details but they know and they can identify a DOI and know what that's about so so this is a really good good thing i think with the data site uh, format so please you can look and find more information or get in touch with with csc if you need some more information about that site and now back to johan for preservation Yes, <clears throat> that was a brief introduction to descriptive metadata. And now I'll continue to talk about preservation metadata. And CSC is a service provider for the national digital preservation services that include cultural heritage uh, data and also is expanding now to cover also research data. So we provide a service for a centralized long-term digital preservation of research data sets. And um, in this, uh, it, the preservation metadata is very important since it describes um, the resources from, the, from an administrative point of view and a technical point of view, and really it tells us and everybody in the future what these resources are about and what can be done with them both on a semantic level and also on a, a technical level. So I'll start by talking about premise, preservation metadata implementation strategies. And this is a, a, the common metadata standard for um, describing um, preservation metadata. And it was created for describing uh, information related to archived digital objects. And uh, 
underlining idea is that all digital assets will become obsolete and the preservation requires some kind of cataloging information about the, the objects themselves, that is the technical aspects of the objects, but also the environment in which the objects are, are accessible and usable. For example, the uh, software they run on. And premise is managed by an international group called the premise maintenance activity and also the premise editorial committee that develops premise standard. And the uh, mm, standard itself is published under the Library of Congress. And the first version of the data dictionary, which is called, was published in 2005. And now the latest and most current version is, is the version 3.0, published a few years ago in 2015. And the uh, premise 2.2 or 2.3 is still widely used, for example, in our uh, national digital preservation services here in, in Finland. And then uh, I'll talk about METS, the other metadata standard, a bit later, but premise is used for describing technical aspects of digital objects, and such as uh, that they can be implemented and used as part of a larger METS document. And I'll talk about this uh, connection and link a bit later. And the premise is basically a data dictionary and an XML schema for implementation. And it's built on the OIS reference model, the Open Archival Information Systems, which is a common model for describing digital preservation systems. And the OIS model defines archival concepts such as um, ingest, for, for uh, receiving digital resources and, and transforming them into an archival information packages and then access that. That's the module for, for disseminating data out of the repository and, and delivering this, this data to customers and users. And the premise, what it does, it translates the OS framework into implementable semantic units. And these units are a digital or an object, event, agent, and rights. And uh, also the, an intellectual entity and the environment can be described using the digital object entity. And this is the premise data model that describes these entities and their um, uh, relations. So an object has a relationship to, to a right statement and to an event. And the event itself uh, has relationship to, to the object or, or to an agent that is performing the, the event. So this is the uh, data model of premise. And I'll talk about um, the different entities. And the first one, or the most important one, you could say is the premise object. It's a unit of information subject to digital preservation. And most commonly, it's a digital file. Uh, but it can also be used to describe a, a bit stream within a file, such as um, a video stream or an audio stream within within um, a container containing both audiovisual data. It can be an intellectual entity, which is um, a set of, of objects or an environment. And describing objects um, use, use elements like an identifier for the object, Fixity information, which is very important. That is, you, you um, write down the, the checksum of the objects, and by recalculating the checksum later on, you can be assured that the object, the digital object, has not been changed if the checksum is the same. Uh, file format information, obviously, very imp important in understanding what the object is all about, and information about the creating application and relationships is a part of the premise object description. And this is an example, an XML document describing a object. Uh, it's an PNG image, and it has got a checksum in an SNMP file, some you can see here, and then the date it was created, and also a link to, uh, to a format registry that defines what kind of uh, file format this is about from an international registry called Pronom. 
and of course the identifier. So the premise event, it uh, describes an action that involves at least one object. And these actions are used for describing preservation activities that the objects, the digital data is subject to, such as fixity checks, virus scans, uh, ingestion processes, replication activities, and, and so on. The, it's important to document what happens to a document in the repository for future use and reference. And elements uh, to describe an event can be in the, the event type. The date and time obviously is important. The outcome of the event and relationship, for example, to objects and, and agents. And here below you can see a typical event described, a creation event using GIMP to create probably the PNG file that we saw earlier on. And the agent uh, describes a person or organization and most commonly a software associated with preservation activities. Describing with uh, what or who did something to an object using the event. So this is a description of, of the GIMP, the image software. The premise rights statement is a set of rights and permissions concerning uh, the objects. And the premise rights typically, they don't describe um, the um, intellectual properties of, or such as uh, the um, IPR or something. It, it describes what kinds of actions that are permitted when preserving the object. Can the object be copied? Can it be changed, migrated? Can something else be done with this object? This is a um, typical use of premise rights statement. And premise encourages the use of controlled vocabularies in a lot of elements, for example, event types. And premise focus, focuses on machine readable technical information. So therefore, usually it's generated automatically by software and it's not really meant for, for human readability. It's machine processing. And premise is very important in our National Preservation Services, and, and um, because it specifically describes these, this kind of data that, that is used in long-term digital preservation, uh, like technical metadata for digital objects and their preservational history. And this also facilitates interoperability since uh, metadata is described in the same way if you use the Venice standard. And it is very widely used in the international digital preservation community. So that was premise preservation metadata. And now I'll continue talking about METS, the metadata encoding and transmission standard. And this is also a standard that we, we use in digital preservation circles and also in the Finnish national digital preservation uh, services. And METS is, um, you can call it a wrapper format. It's used for conveying all sorts of different metadata types that is necessary for managing digital objects. And it's specifically used when transmitting digital resources between repositories. So it's, it's, um, it's a wrapper for including every metadata you, you need for describing the objects when you transmit the objects, for example, to our preservation services. And METS is also published through the Library of Congress and is developed as an initiative of the Digital Library Federation. And it has got its own editorial board also that, that supervises the um, evolution and development of this standard. And um, like I hinted, it combines descriptive, administrative, technical, and structural metadata. METS is expressed in XML and it's composed of uh, different sections, main sections that contain these, the aforementioned metadata, that is the descriptive and administrative metadata and so on. And these are called uh, the DMD section for descriptive metadata section, AMD sec for administrative metadata section, 
the file section for listing files and the structural metadata section or the script map. It also includes a header describing the METS object itself. And METS is quite flexible and it supports creating your own METS profiles for, for including and, and defining uh, attributes and, and, and the use of METS. And um, the Finnish National Digital Operation Services, we have defined two such profiles, one for cultural heritage material and another one, a very similar one for, for research data. And this is uh, basically what the METS document looks like. Uh, all the, the sections that are included, and you can see it contains the header, descriptive metadata, then a large section called the administrative metadata section that in itself includes uh, prominence information, that is uh, information about uh, the, um, the history and, and of the digital objects and the assets described technical metadata section, access rights, source metadata, and also a preservation plan can be included in the METS document. And uh, the structural metadata is the, the only mandatory part of the METS document as per the METS standard. And it is used for describing the, the relationships between and the structure of the whole information package that is described in a MES document. So if you have, uh, for example, a digitized book, you use the structural metadata to tell that this file is the, the cover, this is page one, and this is page two, and they have to come in sequence for the, for the object to be intelligible, that is. And you can you describe all sorts of different structures using this structural map, a logical structure or a physical structure. And this also then links a lot of these uh, sections together. And the last section is the file reference section, listing files. And uh, the point is that each of these sections have um, a unique ID that is used within the METS document for referencing uh, within document and linking these sections together. So you can describe a part of the resource in the descriptive method section and then you use the link of this section. Uh, in the structure map to tell that this part, these files are described using this metadata. And inside the descriptive metadata section, you can include uh, lots of different metadata, both in XML and in other formats. And you can also uh, link outside the document if you have your metadata uh, outside the document itself. And here's an example of uh, Dublin Core. Very basic Dublin core used within the METS descriptive metadata section. And the METS header itself describes the, the document. And then I'll move on to the administrative metadata section. First one is the technical metadata that contains information about digital objects, that is technical aspects. And typically, like we use in our preservation services, we describe uh, the, these objects as using the premise metadata. The Digiprov MD describes the provenance uh, metadata, that is the history of the document, typically using premise events and agents in, this, in these sections that can be repeated, of course. And then, Source metadata describes usually the original source. For example, you can describe an analog source if you have digitized materials. And RightsMD contains information about intellectual property rights and, and licenses for using the object. And um, FileSec is the list of all files and bit streams that are included or described using the METS document. And it has to contain parts to these digital objects and also links to, to technical metadata, for example, and, and digital provenance metadata. And here below, you'll see uh, an example, single file in the file section of the METS, with links to technical metadata sections and the path of the file within this document or this package.
and the structural metadata, like I said, it can be either a physical or logical structure. And this um, um, structural metadata section combines uh, descriptive metadata and, and uh, the digital objects described in the file set. So th this, this wraps them all together, so to say. And you can use also structural links and behavior sex in METS, but they are quite rare and not used by us in our National Preservation Services. This is the um, homepage of the METS under the Library of Congress. And this is very, very important for interoperability since it's used for transmitting assets between repositories and including all metadata between them. And like premise, METS is also used for automatic processing. So it's not meant for, for human readability also. And it, it's a common international used format for documenting OS information packages. And like I said, we use it in our national long-term digital preservation services here in, in Finland. And one problem we have with METS, at least here, in our services, since we include all metadata for an information package within one METS document, that it can easily grow very big, making it also slow to process even uh, using um, a machine. Uh, for example, if you have an information package containing thousands of tens of thousands of, of digital objects, then you have to describe all of them in this METS document, which means thousands or tens of thousands technical metadata sections and uh, also links to these from the FileSec listing all the files in this information package and the structural metadata also. So these METS files, at least among us, can grow very big. And this is one example of, of the structure within our national digital preservation services where we have defined the mandatory and, and elements and attributes and also elements and attributes that we do not recommend to be used in our national profiles. Also including some um, national attributes in this uh, profile for describing for example, the, the contracts and the, the specification version when entering our services. So, thank you. This was a brief introduction and I hope you got something interesting from this and it has raised some, some ideas. And now you can ask questions here in the chat box and we will try to answer them the best we can. Yes, please. Uh... Well, as you can see, you really need a lot of metadata to, to be able to do preservation. But a lot of the, these METs and these can be automatically generated, I think, of the yes. technical stuff. But still, you need to have uh, very clear uh, information about the rights and, and, and many, many uh, things that concern the provenance. And also, if you don't have the descriptive metadata in place, then it's no use, maybe even <laughs> preserving, because then you can't find uh, anything, any information about the content. So, so all parts are important, and and data set is used for research data in, in our national preservation services. So, yes, and um, we have also published uh, tools for creating these uh, premise and and met metadata. But like Jessica said, you still have to know about your resources and know what they're about because um, you are the expert on your own contents. We can only aid in, in technical uh, issues, uh, but, but we, we don't know basically why as an asset has to be preserved and what it's all about. Yes, yes. and also there is the, the list of sort of recommended or approved uh, metadata formats, formats also in the national profiles is constantly uh, can be updated if there there are needs, but but we need to have at a minimum at least the data, data site information for for the research data. So, but this is a, an ongoing development, mm -hmm. and yes. we're happy to hear from you. So, do we have any questions? 
to start them to read about mm -hmm. the the Mao Tse Lao. Not the names. <laughs> And like we said in the beginning, this um, webinar is recorded and will be available on YouTube later on also. So you can spread the word mm -hmm. using this link here in the chat box. Mm -hmm. And yes, the slides are also available. Yeah. No questions? Mm -hmm. Well. <laughs> We were really thorough. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you for attending. Yes. Okay. Bye bye. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you. Oh. Yes. And um, please answer also the response uh, questionnaire that. We linked in the chat. Oh, okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.